Welcome to Crime Beat. I'm Anthony Robart. Tonight, whispers of evil grow between the trees as one by one, five women mysteriously vanish from a rural region of British Columbia's southern interior. It's really isolated. There is no cell range service. The fear grows that Caitlin Potts is never coming home. We put a lot of manpower into this, 10 to 20 people in a day. It's terrifying. You, you want to find her, but you know that that might not be the outcome. If people don't understand the grief and the pain, the agony that a parent goes through when their child first goes missing. People always had, you know, these stories about that area. You don't really know what's happening out there and people don't ask a lot of questions. I'm thinking, okay, is this uh, another serial killer out there? Are they all going to be found together? Here now is Jules Knox with The Secrets of Salmon River. The Shoe Swap region of British Columbia is rich in wilderness. The Salmon River glides through this territory, babbling brooks helping to fill its waters. Old growth ponderosa pines tower over hilly terrain their roots sinking deep into the soil, tall trunks casting dark shadows over the earth. If only these trees could talk. This is land that holds secrets. That is so beautiful. Caitlin Potts loves the outdoors. Going all the way down. She moved to BC in the fall of 2015 and spends her free time exploring the land. The 27-year-old is from Samson Cree Nation in Alberta. Caitlin is goofy, bubbly, and outgoing. Caitlin is staying with a boyfriend in the Enderby area of the North Okanagan. But a few months later, she's ready for a change. She told me that she was going to come to Calgary to come see me and my baby and she was going to catch a ride on Kijiji Rideshare at 7 p.m. that night. That is on February 22, 2016. But Caitlin doesn't show up at her sister's. On March 1st, she was reported missing after she'd been out of contact for about eight days, which was unusual for her. Taking the stuff. bushy bush. And we'll just go through, so we'll take our time. I have to keep going. I have, we just want to know where she's at. I want to bring her home. Family and friends start searching for Caitlin. At the time, police say she was last spotted near this bridge in downtown Enderby. It's a matter that we're taking very seriously, but we aren't at the point yet to say that we believe that foul play is involved. It's just you know, we're still very actively searching for Caitlin. On the first search, we were looking actually for Caitlin's house, and the RCMP wouldn't give you know any details about where her house was, not even to the family. Caitlin had posted pictures on her own Instagram, and we matched those pictures up with the mountainous ranges in the area, and then managed to locate her house. It's really isolated. There is no cell range service. Good evening. With each passing day, the possibility becomes more of a reality, and the fear grows that Caitlin Potts is never coming home. The mother knows nothing at this point, and that's what's heartbreaking. She knows nothing. There's not been really a lot of contact with her. And every time we've talked with her, she's got really highly emotional. Six weeks before Caitlin's disappearance, two health workers say the 27-year-old turned to police for help. She was in a domestic abusive situation and that she needed a ride out of the situation as soon as possible. And it was in the middle of winter 
and um, they had told her uh, that they don't give rides and that there was nothing that they could do to help her out. The health workers drive Caitlin to a safe house for women in Salmon Arm. And the next time they hear about her is when they see Caitlin's face on a missing person's poster. The women say they immediately call police with a tip they believe can help find Caitlin. We didn't hear back. Caitlin's living situation isn't clear. After leaving the safe house, some say she moved in with a roommate. Well, she's out there. I just want her to come home. And as long as she's found, so I can take her home. There was an allegation, you know, that she was dropped off in my community near an RV park. So we went and interviewed the people at the RV park and the RCMP had never been there. You know, I'm not in a position to provide specifics around an ongoing investigation. I can appreciate there's lots of questions that people have. Two months after Caitlin vanishes, about half an hour away, another woman disappears. 32-year-old Ashley Simpson is living south of Salmon Arm, BC, and halfway across the country from her parents in Ontario. The 27th of April, she FaceTimed me at 11 o'clock in the morning. She had said, going out, going to Margaret Falls today, she said, and I found a, a raw garnet. She said, when I get home, I'm making you a birthstone ring. And what was she like in that conversation? Talk about going hiking, she was happy. She was doing what she loved to do. Ashley is living in a trailer with her boyfriend, Derek Favel. Brent Cox owns the property and sees her that same day. Well, that day, um, she seemed great. Um, and then right before I left the town, her and Derek got into a little bit of a fight. Oh, I didn't. It wasn't much of a fight. I just heard Ashley kind of yelling a little bit, and I asked her just to, you know, keep it down. We kind of had a bit of a fight. I ended up going to sleep, and when I woke up in the morning, um, I thought Brent to drove her into town or drove her down to someone's to go we'll spend a couple days because she had done it before, where she had taken off that night. And we had to go go take her to uh, or get someone to go pick her up. I came home that evening and nobody was here. Um, the next morning I learned from Derek that Ashley had left. Um, he had received a text from her in the morning that she was gone and she'd send for her stuff. So she left to make her way home is what I was under the impression of and uh, I would have figured she would have gone somewhere and gotten some money for the, a plane or bus ticket. It was a Saturday morning and my youngest daughter Amanda was here. We were waiting for Ashley to FaceTime because she always did. and. There was nothing. That's when Cindy Simpson learns that Ashley's boyfriend has been in touch with her niece. Derek had messaged her to see if she had heard from Ashley. They had an argument. She left three days ago. Uh, he hasn't heard from her. He had said he reported her missing. I called Salmon Arm RCMP and there was no report of her missing. I reported her missing on the 30th of April. They didn't even have the address. They had to find the address because I didn't know it. That's when your life starts to change. As soon as you've made that call, you go limp. The last day she was seen alive was April 27th. Apparently, they went home after Margaret Falls there was a fight over money and where the money went and we knew there was a party or a dispute that night uh, that she disappeared. And apparently she left, he went to sleep. When he woke up she wasn't there and there was a text message saying I'll send for my stuff. That was the initial from the RCMP what they were relayed by Derek. He said that she told him that she was going to hitchhike home. Um, she never got here. It all went dark after that. 
Coming up, the search for Ashley. Her father flies across the country to find his daughter. Will he come across any clues in the land? Two families are desperate for any trace of their missing daughters. Caitlin Potts is last heard from on February 22nd, 2016. And two months later, just a half an hour away, Ashley Simpson also vanishes. Could the disappearances be connected? We now return to Jules Knox with The Secrets of Salmon River. If people don't understand the grief and the pain, the agony that a parent goes through when their child first goes missing, and you would stop at nothing to find that child, and you drop everything and you go to another province to look, and there's nobody there to help, your mind is racing through what the possibilities could be and the police don't help you. They don't act on it immediately. They treated Ashley's disappearance for the first three or four days as a boyfriend-girlfriend fight, and she'll come back in a couple of days. What I had a hard time with was the no information, especially one RCMP officer early on in the investigation. I felt like I was talking to a robot, like he was reading from a script. The only things we know is what we dug up and, and found out. Like we, we knew about one item that, that, that they didn't know of and then when they got wind of that, they had told us to back off. Go back home, you're disturbing the case. RCMP say that when a person first goes missing, officers conduct a risk assessment and the file is monitored on a daily basis. Avenues of investigations may have very well have been explored that the family was not necessarily privy to, and we do that in order to ensure that moving forward there is a substantial likelihood of the charges being met in, in a case where we think that the, a person has uh, died from criminality. Was it unusual for Ashley to go missing? Absolutely. She couldn't go six or seven hours without taking a selfie and putting it online. And, and she'd be searching for signals in, in that area. When I got out to BC and seen where she was, it is exactly where she wanted to be. We're explorers. So she had the chance to do that. Dad, I'm gonna, mu I'm gonna pan for minerals. You know how happy she was saying that? The people Ashley was a bundle of joy, um, really, full of energy. She loved everybody. She loved kids. She was just that person. When you met her, you just wanted to embrace her. She was just full of that aura of love. The fishing, the hiking started when she was about two or three with her dad. She loved all of that. She's such a beautiful little child, chubby, ringlet hair. My youngest girl, um, she's got four children, and they keep asking, when is Auntie Ashley coming home? So, I mean, that's tough to deal with on a, on a daily basis. Say smile! Smile! <laughs> smile! What are you guys doing? Planting. Really? With my granddaughter. There's video of her, they're doing Mother's Day planters and just singing and, and dancing. And my oldest granddaughter, we called her uh, Mini Me for Ashley because they're just so much alike. And she's the one that took it the hardest. She didn't smile for the longest time and I said, how come you're not smiling? You, she said, Noni, there's no reason to smile anymore. Ashley Simpson had gone missing, so I had met her father, John, and I noticed that there wasn't a lot of volunteers, you know, going 
to the site to help this guy search for his daughter. I felt like I needed to stand to work to mobilize people. I continued to, to learn how do you do a ground search? How do you recruit people you know, that will come and help you? How do you fundraise to do that? Because putting money out of your own pocket, I mean, to do anything in the movement, it's, it's expensive. And how do you determine what area you're gonna search? Well, based, based on facts. Where was she living? You know, uh, who was she hanging around with? And then trying to compile what you think a story is. And then trying to determine, you know, where would, you know, somebody likely bury a person? Hopefully I can find her. If I can't, well, next year is another year. I'll save again, come back, do the same thing until we can, we can get her home. There was a lot of unearthing and poking around, you know, and, and kind of trying to learn the land. Where somebody has buried, you can feel like an air pocket. It'll push. But where there's hard, hard solid ground and, and the ground hasn't been disturbed, you're just going to hit like a rock. Nobody really did, in their heart of hearts, want to actually find, you know, and deal with a murdered person. But to try to help the families get some type of closure, you know, that's what we did. You're personally involved in it. You won't know the pain and suffering and the heart-wrenching that goes on within the family. We're not giving up. We never will. Coming up. Soon, a third woman's family isn't giving up either. Three months after Ashley is last seen, another woman vanishes, and she lives just down the road. The search continues for Caitlin Potts, who disappears from the Enderby area, and Ashley Simpson, who vanishes from Yankee Flats Road a short distance away. Soon, there's a third woman missing, and she is Ashley's neighbor. We return now to Jules Knox and the secrets of Salmon River. Minutes away from Ashley Simpson's place, on Yankee Flats Road south of Salmon Arm, 46-year-old Deanna Wirtz lives in a home where her backyard is wilderness. It's a mountain, right? Like, it's rough, it's rugged. She would go barefoot for hours and go hiking up the mountain. I don't know how. It's, she just did it. She loved it. I guess she just wanted to feel the earth. It had the feet of a hobbit. <laughs> She was just such, she was such a fun sister. <laughs> oh, mom! But going to her house was just, you were free. She was quite a bit older, so she got me into a lot of trouble. She just, she didn't care. <laughs> she doesn't care what anybody thinks. She'd come pick me up out in Clearwater and drive me out to her place. We'd spend about three days just staying up all night playing uh, the Road Rash video game. And she was obsessed with fitness at the time, so she'd be doing crunches while I was playing, and I'd hand it off to her, and then we'd drive all the way back, and she took the long route, like scenic route. It was, it was just great. I remember that like it was yesterday. Her wildlife artistry was just unreal. She was so artistic. Loved animals. Huge animal lover. Um, she loved her son, Damon, with everything she had. She loved him so much. Her, her son was her whole world. So to lose him was uh, life shattering for her. On Mother's Day, um, May 13th, 2012, he took his own life. Four years pass after the death of Deanna's 21-year-old son. Her family says she has her struggles but is looking ahead to the future. She contacted family and some friends and just kind of catching up with people, making plans for the future, like with Alana to go to shows. She wanted to meet uh, her nephew, Alana's son, who she hasn't met yet. I phoned her on her birthday, left her a message. She called me back the next day. Um, so I talked to her July the 8th and we had a great talk. She went missing July 19th and I got a call 
uh, from my, our other brother. Her husband left for the airport that morning, and then after he left, she phoned him, she phoned other family members that same morning. I'm kind of distraught and, and upset. She had called some crisis line, um, trying to talk, just to want to talk about Damon. She got really frustrated because nobody, they kept on transferring her call to different departments and this and that, and she got frustrated and she said, none of you are helping me, and she hung up. And then, so that's why the, the big panic was kind of on, like, where's Deanna? Because she called her mom and said, I'm going to, I'm going to go up the mountain, I'm going to go for a hike. And that was literally the last anybody heard from her. What happened next, nobody knows. She literally disappeared, just poof. Her phone was at home, her wallet, there's been no bank activity, her shoes, her clothes, like, they could not figure out what piece of clothing was even missing. Nobody saw her walking along the road. She literally vanished. And then later on that day, I guess her dog, like her dog was, if, if Deanna was outside, her dog was with her. Like, and the dog never left her. And then the do her dog was found at a nearby neighbor's house by itself. And that was like, okay. We put a lot of manpower into this, uh, uh, 10 to 20 people in a day, uh, people coming home after midnight. It's terrifying. You, you want to find her. Um, you want to find her safe, obviously, but you know that that might not be the outcome. You're literally looking up and you're looking down and you're looking out. And I remember driving home and I'm coming through Vernon and I stopped and I just started crying and I phoned my boss and I was like, we haven't found her yet. Like, I don't even know what to do. Like, I, I don't want to leave the bush because my sister's still there. <laughs> you know? We searched for a week straight. I think we maybe got one or two hours of sleep a night. When you learn that Ashley only lived a few doors down, it was unnerving. You're looking for Deanna, but then you know that there's another missing girl. So you're keeping your eyes out for that as well. You don't want to be in the bush without somebody because you know these women have all gone missing. Like, I'm not going to go searching out there by myself. Like, if there is somebody out there hurting these women, you don't want to be alone. So we're grid searching this one area and we're coming down the road. Then we come up to uh, a barbed wire fence and we can hear these dogs barking. And then we hear people yelling at us, like vulgar, like swearing at us, get the hell out of there. Um, this private property and the police piped up and said, hey, we're here, we're doing a search for the missing person, Deanna Wirtz in the area, I'm sure you know of her. And he's like, I don't effing care, like, get out of here. And it was the property that uh, her dog was found at. And that was a bit alarming. When we came out of the forest, Alana and myself, we stumbled onto the road and we saw two kids on their quads coming up. And we said, we're searching for a sister. They asked if it was Ashley, and we said, no, it's Deanna, and that's, they completely shut down. They wouldn't speak to us, and they took off. And that, and those are the kids of the guy who's on the property. For him to react like that, it's very suspicious to me. They had alibis, apparently, from what I've been told. Um, so you want to believe that they were questioned thoroughly, but of course, the thought of it is in the back of your mind. Absolutely, it can't not be. <laughs> we have no answers, so you, uh, in, as a sister, I don't rule anything out. Those neighbors say they have no comment on Deanna's dog and whether or not it was found on their property when she vanished. They also say they did not have anything to do with Deanna's disappearance. We've pretty much exhausted uh, the clues that we have, so uh, we are actually, we'd, we'd love it if anybody had any information to Deanna's whereabouts to call the Vernon RCMP office. I wrote a letter to the local paper and they published it. I wrote a letter about the RCMP incompetence in the area, how little of a search area they actually did, the fact that the First Nations community themselves had to go out with their drones and everything. They, they just didn't do much. RCMP only took us up because I wrote a letter to the local paper. The area is massive. I understand the trouble that searching that area is. 
it's surreal. You're up there with the police and you're looking for your, your sister. Like, nobody should have to do that. Is she down there somewhere? Like, where, with, where on earth could she be? It's so huge. When they're pointing out kind of the area that you searched, at the time when you were searching it, you felt like it was, you've covered so much ground. But when you're up in the helicopter and they're showing you, it's like, that's a puddle <laughs> compared to an ocean. Like, it's crazy. There's so much mountain up there that still should have been searched. When we landed back in Kelowna, the investigator made a comment to me and told me, I hope this is good enough for you. You can't go to the press again. It's something along those lines that was completely inappropriate. Coming up. Police released surveillance video of the last known sighting of one of the missing women, more than a year after she vanishes. Will it help solve any cases? And there's another disappearance. Caitlin Potts had been missing for more than a year when police release a new clue to the public. And a month later, a fourth woman goes missing, mysteriously vanishing from a community that completes a triangle in a growing trail of disappearances. We return now to Jules Knox and the secrets of Salmon River. In April 2017, police released surveillance video of one of the last known sightings of Caitlin Potts. It's taken on February 21st, 2016, the day before her final Facebook post, announcing she's heading back to Calgary. We believe this is likely uh, a homicide. She has likely met with foul play. We have no information about her movement in and around the time that uh, she was at Orch Orchard Park Mall, but certainly we're looking for um, any information the public might be able to relay to us. Caitlin is seen entering Orchard Park Mall in Kelowna, a city that's 80 kilometers south of where searchers first started looking. But police don't release that video until she's been missing for 14 months. Do you think that more witnesses might have come forward sooner had police released that video in a timely manner? Absolutely. We know, you know, by human nature that the memory works best right after an incident has occurred. Perhaps they were following up on tips, other tips in order to get there, but there's a lot of value in holding some piece of information for later in the investigation to be released so that we can reflag that for the community. When she was last spotted in Kelowna, it's not clear if Caitlin was staying near Enderby with her on again, off again boyfriend, or if she had moved out with a new roommate in Salmon Arm, which is minutes away from where Ashley and Deanna vanished, or perhaps she was staying somewhere else. But between all of these places is the city of Vernon. And that is where 18-year-old Tracy Jenneru is living in 2017. <clears throat> She's always a really happy, hyper kid, lots of plans, quite a little entrepreneur. Her dad had a lot of friends, so she used to make them buy toys to get entrance in the house. <laughs> She was wonderful, she was feisty, she was fun, she was energetic, she had a heart of gold. She loved to climb trees. I would take her on outings to parks and anywhere. It was all about having fun and laughing. She really loved animals. Ducks were one of her favorite, but uh, she knew I was terrified of pit bulls. She knocked on the door and she's standing there all happy with this pit bull. Grandma, you'll like him, you'll really like him. And she made me like him, she really did. We brought him in the house. You know, up until she was a teenager, she was very goal-oriented and very, very conservative and strict in her ways. She had some struggles um, with the drugs and I don't know how much alcohol was involved, but she had some struggles with that and she was trying to overcome those and she was doing really good at it. The last few years, she's been 
doing the street life. She wanted out. My son, from what I understand, um, she was over at his place and she was uh, going to uh, look at the stars because it was a clear night and she had to run to her mother's for uh, a telescope and she was going to take it back to her dad's and they were going to look at the stars together. She texted me at about 9.30 that night asking for a telescope because she, I bought her a telescope last Christmas because she likes to look at the stars. But I didn't get it until after. I didn't close until 11. So I didn't answer her. And that was the last I heard from her. She didn't make it back to her dad's, no. She's going up to her mom's, going back to her dad's, and this happened in between that. Nobody knows the in-between. And uh, this is getting a little bit tough. And I guess that's the last time he saw her. That is on May 29th, 2017. 11 days later, Tracy is reported missing. Police did send out a news release, but they wait until Tracy has been missing for more than a month. The teen is 4 feet 11 inches tall. At 42 kilograms, she weighs less than 100 pounds. Unfortunately, when you're on the street running around and have that kind of lifestyle, I don't think they really go looking for you right away. And that's unfortunate because sometimes you really are in trouble and you do need help. The community of Malakwa is nestled in the Monashi Mountains in British Columbia's Shuswap area. Less than 600 people call it home. One of them is Nicole Bell, a mom of three. Super mom, she loved being a mom. She's a beautiful soul. She's fun, energetic, um, loving, caring. She just loved life. She was amazing, sister. We grew up camping, fishing. We did a lot of things together as a family. She was just amazing. She was there for everybody. She was the one that held us all together. I remember before family picture days, eh? She and her other sister decided they were gonna cut each other's hair. <laughs> she just got married actually August 14th. 2016 so just about a year before she uh, disappeared and yeah it was a great wedding she actually got married on our anniversary <laughs> so she was sentimental like that last time I spoke to her was in August of 2017 I was in Nashville Tennessee at that time and then on my return Back to home, Casey had asked me, her husband had asked me if I had heard from Nicole, and I said, no, I hadn't. And she was reported missing then. I tried to call her on her cell phone and she didn't pick up. She didn't pick up. I miss my friend. I miss my best friend. I don't know what was going on. I just miss her. She would not leave her kids behind. There's no way she would leave her children behind. Jane Aubertin says that on September 2nd, 2017, Nicole's husband, Casey, was home with their children when Nicole went missing. She, um, she just left and didn't come back. It was certainly interesting when, you know, they located her phone in the Salmon Arm area, given that she resided in a little bit further away in the Malacqua area. As far as I know, she didn't have a vehicle at that time. She lived in Malacqua. Her phone was found in Salmon Arm, which is about 45 minutes away. So we're not even sure exactly where she went missing. Nicole's phone is found about 20 minutes north of where Ashley and Deanna vanished, and in the same community where Caitlin may have been living with their roommate before her disappearance. 
who was the last person to speak to her was her husband. To my understanding is um, she was reported missing on the 7th of September, but they dated it back to September 2nd from the last time that her husband had contact with her. I know it sounds weird, but... Do you know why he might have waited five days to report her missing? I don't know what was going through his mind at that time. Do you think he's involved in any of this? Absolutely not. That never even crossed our minds. Why do you think it's not him? Casey, it, her husband is a wonderful man. He is warm, he loves his kids, he loved Nicole. He, he's just, no, he's not involved. And it never even crossed my mind. Never even crossed our mind that he would be involved in her disappearance. Six weeks before Nicole goes missing, Casey changes his Facebook relationship status to complicated. And just five months after his wife vanishes, his profile says he's in a new relationship with a different woman. He did not respond to our questions about that timeline or why he did not immediately report his wife missing. Casey is not named as a suspect or charged in Nicole's disappearance. Five women now missing from the area over the course of 19 months. There are no arrests and no public suspects. But then, suddenly from police, there is a public warning. Coming up, could the Mounties' public warning about a rural property on Salmon River Road have anything to do with the missing women? Five families are on edge. Loosely encircled by the communities where each of the five missing women vanished sits a property that catches the attention of police. Activity in the area has prompted RCMP to issue a stern and unusual warning to stay away. We now return to Jules Knox and the secrets of Salmon River. Salmon River Road snakes through the lands of farms and forests. Properties here are rural and remote. And at one of them, RCMP say a 36-year-old man allegedly pulled a gun on a sex trade worker in late August. It's minutes from where Deanna and Ashley both disappeared. There was a gunshot about 3 a.m. in the morning. Somebody had ordered up a call girl and um, apparently he pulled a gun on her and her car was down there across the river. Here was a car right, right there. It um, had come across the bridge, backed over the bank. The lights were still on and it was idling. Up the road, just a little bit there, I found a pink slipper. So I picked it up and threw it on the hood of the car. Somehow she managed to get away from him is what we, we understood at that time, right? The footprints, after she got out of the car, she never even turned it off, she just ran. Now why would you run? I couldn't even step between the bare feet footprints up there. She was so terrified. What's the name of this creek here? Salmon River. Salmon River, eh? Soon after the public warning, police start searching a property on Salmon River Road. The search is uh, related to an ongoing investigation uh, that is uh, uh, unfolding. Uh, at this time, however, we're not in a position uh, to uh, indicate exactly which investigation this is related to. People always had, you know, these stories about that area, you know, kind of like it's a backwoods. You don't really know what's happening out there and people don't ask a lot of questions. Given the size of the property, which is over 24 acres in size, the number of the outbuildings that are involved and the different objects that are on site, uh, we've brought in additional resources. 
you're going through, looking through drawers, you're looking through closets, in cabinets, under cabinets, in boxes, it takes time. And so a 24 acre property, they're not only looking inside residences and, and outbuildings, you're also looking in the ground because who knows, there may be evidence that could be gleaned from the ground. Now, with respect to what prompted them to dig that day, that area, I wouldn't be aware of, of what that information led them to doing that. Um, it could have been anything from visual cues when they were examining the property to freshly disturbed areas. You would certainly be able to tell if something was disturbed recently compared to you know, something that's been undisturbed for years. And that's quite highly probable or possible that that was the case. There's definitely bodies there. I'm wondering how many bodies are there. Uh, we're running on the line. Is is Ashley one of is, is Ashley there? In one sense, you don't want her to be there, but in the other sense, you're like, it'd be nice to find her. You know. Then you think of Picton. That name went through a lot of people's minds. I think. Oh my God! Is this another? You know, is there a copycat out there? It's hard to keep going. Serial killer Robert Picton is believed to be responsible for murdering nearly 50 women on his pig farm in a suburb of Vancouver, some of the cases dating decades back. Many of his victims were sex trade workers. And after getting away with it for years, Picton was arrested in 2002 and convicted of the second degree murder of half a dozen women in 2007. In the Picton investigation, something that the RCMP had no capacity to, to handle. They didn't know how to talk to these people. They didn't know how to protect them. They didn't know uh, how to manage an investigation where there might be more than one um, accused. So that's something I would look into is whether, you know, do we have a bit of a crew of, of, of people harming women? You know, there's a lot to look at there. The fact that, like our case, you know, you had fairly steady number and then a spike, that's not a one-off, something's happening. I'm thinking, okay, is this uh, another serial killer out there? Are they all gonna be found together? It was a trigger, you know, for all Indigenous women when they hear farm, they hear missing woman, you know, they automatically goes back to Picton because it hasn't been that long. It's hard to know what exactly happens behind closed doors and if any of the missing women might have turned to the sex trade and been called out to this property. I'm, I'm afraid for a lot of people that might be missing. It's definitely um, on the minds of people in the community about like what's happening and um, uh, I, one community member uh, commented just on Thursday that, you know, she's lived here all her life and she's never um, heard of so many people missing. RCMP members have been here around the clock and it's expected to remain that way for the foreseeable future. During the investigation today, a forensic team zeroed in on a horse trailer, combing over it quite extensively and dusting for fingerprints. We're taking it one day at a time. We're fully prepared to be at that location for, for several days to come. I mean, if there was something to be found there, I think they probably would have found it by now. Coming up in part two of The Secrets of Salmon River, police make a grisly discovery that leaves five families on edge. They asked for DNA and it, and it took some time because apparently they had uh, many body parts that they had to test to figure out if it was more than one person. Of course that thought is like, oh my God, is this gonna be Deanna? Like, it's so close to her place, it's like it's gotta be. We don't have a body so we can't talk like she's dead. Till I have a body, I, I wanna hang on to some hope. Do you think that there could be a serial killer preying on women in this area? Well, I haven't seen anything that makes me think there isn't. Unfortunately, this is what they look like, and this is what this case looks like to me. The Secrets of Salmon River continues next week on Crime. I'm Anthony Robart, 
Thank you for joining us tonight on Crime Beat. Want more episodes of Crime Beat? Listen to the Crime Beat podcast now for free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your favorite podcast. And for past episodes of Crime Beat, go to the Global TV app, visit globaltv.com, or check out our Crime Beat YouTube page.